So this lesson, we focus on the idea of, of uh, Chicano homosexuality. You had two articles that focus on, uh, obviously, one on women, one on men. One's more historical, one's more theoretical. But um, I think it's a very important subject to address, particularly because, you know, either, you know, we, uh, some of us have family that might be gay, but also I think what's more important is this notion that um, throughout history, Mexican Americans have addressed issues about civil rights and obviously being acknowledged. And it's a bit hypocritical for some of us to say, well, I want my rights, but I don't want these other people to have their rights. And um, I think this is why I, I think it's important to, to examine the history of Chicano homosexuality. And hopefully you found something interesting that you did not know. So we'll address it here in the lecture and uh, probably have a discussion associated with this particular subject. So this has come about from some research um, that I used to do. When I originally went to grad school, my, my original dissertation topic was on Chicano homosexuality, looking at it from the 19, uh, 1900s to 1950s. And it was really hard to find material for this subject, so I had to change to something else. But nevertheless, it's a subject that I just found very intriguing. And um, just kind of, uh, you know, the stuff that I did find just was very fascinating. So here you have... Uh, a picture of the famous event that you all read, right? Los 41. And uh, we'll talk about that too, but like everything else, I'll give some context to it. So, before I get into the subject itself, I want to give you a very kind of generic version of, Chica of homosexuality and have you understand it from a more academic perspective i'm sure you all have your opinion some of you might agree with it some of you might not agree with it based on whatever reasons you might have um but understand number one it's not going to go away and number two it's always been around so uh whether you like it or not it's there right um my wife always says you know never hate anybody because they end up in your family right <laughs> so don't ever hate anybody because they you know you're you, if you do hate them you're gonna have a son that might be gay or a daughter or whatever, right? Um, you know, if you hate black people, you're gonna have them in your family in some shape or form. So never hate, because it's not worth the, the energy and it's just not right, right? So uh, nevertheless, I do wanna show you a history of gay history, if you will, but also have you understand that when it comes to sexuality, it's a very complicated issue because a lot of times sexuality is very fluid. You know, things that we define as gay today mm, would have never been perceived as gay, historically speaking. Okay, so um, here we're really kind of focusing on the Middle Ages because Christianity tends to have a large influence on the way we define homosexuality. Um, but even then, it's, it's very complicated. And if you take my History 100, you know, History 101 class, we dig a little bit deeper into this. But, you know, in ancient Greece and ancient Rome, homosexuality was never a big deal every roman emperor with the exception of one um was what we would call today homosexual and uh it's it's in, it's in the uh, middle ages where that begins to kind of change and um the you know society begins to look down on it not just homosexuality but all sexual acts so just to give you an idea that um, in the Middle Ages, we see, believe it or not, a lot of homosexual activity happening. <laughs> and most of it's happening within the church. I'm not sure if that's surprising to anybody, but um, <clears throat> a lot of the sources that we have um, come from the church where guys got caught being with other guys and you know they got in trouble, they got written up basically, and, and we have all this great material to tell us what was happening. Uh, there's a great example where um, the abbot had to sleep with all the monks because what would happen is that a lot of times they would, you know, go into each other's bed and things would happen. And then sometimes when, you know, the church wasn't happy, the, happy about this stuff happening, but a lot of the monks would confess to each other during confession. And, you know, it wasn't just a slap on the wrist. And, and that's what we see happening in the Middle Ages is that, is it a sin? Was, you know, was being with another man or a woman being with another woman a sin? Yeah, it was. I'm not going to deny that, you know. 
but so was a bunch of other things. And if you ever study church history, everything's a sin, basically. Um, what we would call homosexuality was no bigger sin than anything else, in other words. Right? Being with a prostitute was a sin. Being with a girlfriend was a sin. You know, um, doing certain things that has nothing to do with sex was a sin. So everything was a sin, according to the church. And just to give you an example, you know, going hunting was actually a bigger sin than engaging in this type of relationship. So it just kind of goes to show, a lot of us think, well, they must have been really harsh on homosexuals during this period that we call the Middle Ages. And we find that that's not the case. Uh, they were hard on them, I guess, a uh, year penance for engaging in this relationship, but it was no worse than, than anything else, as we see hunting was much worse. <clears throat> and when it came to defining these, this idea of homosexuality, Throughout history, it's very problematic because there was never a clear definition. Every era defines it differently. Like I said, in Rome, it, it was allowed. You know, you had male prostitutes. It was taxed. During the Middle Ages, um, a lot of times people say, well, the word sodomy referred to homosexuality because a lot of times today we refer to this word as homosexual. What we find is that no. Number one. Uh, prior to the 1900s, there is no concept of homosexuality. So um, <clears throat> that's quite important to note because it actually relates to what we study in this class, right? The event uh, of Los 41 happens around the 19th, uh, the 20th century, right? Uh, late 19th century and um, early 20th century. So the word sodomy is very complicated because basically any act, whether heterosexual or homosexual, would have been considered um, sodomy, right? Today, again, we normally associate it with homosexuality, but, you know, oral sex, anal sex, understand that heterosexual people engage in, in this type of behavior, right? Um, depending on the position that you were in, right? If the woman was on top or, you know, again, different, what they would define as animalistic positions, would have been considered sodomy, and obviously men with men and women with women. Women with women is a little bit more complicated because there's no, um, what they would define as no insertion happening. So that, that got a little bit murky. But uh, regardless, even heterosexuals during this period would have been defined as sodomites. So the word sodomy kind of is very umbrella term to define every sexual act. Because um, according to the church during this era, the ideal relationship is not between man and woman, which a lot of times we think that's the way the church would have defined it, but it's man and God. The church really wanted you to have no sex, you know? <laughs> so uh, they, they really tried to limit it as much as possible, and they felt they were superior because they were not supposed to engage in sex at all, which they did. Obviously, you know, they always got caught. But um, they felt like they were superior for not for practicing something called asceticism, which is basically not engaging in the will of the body. <clears throat> um, but we find that it wasn't a big deal. Uh, by the 1400s, things begin to change. Um, you have in places like Florence, they establish a police force called the Office of the Night. And it's actually in, in this era where they really begin to come down on this type of behavior with the Inquisition and organizations such as the Office of the Night, where it's basically a police force that goes around be, uh, um, addressing people's behavior right, and actions. And they would arrest people if, you know, you could basically narc somebody out and say, oh, yeah, I think my neighbor's engaged in this stuff. And they would come and arrest you and then investigate you. So in 1520, uh, 1512, we find that for many people, they saw this as very natural to be with another man. You know, it doesn't, doesn't necessarily make them gay. It just meant that it's, it's, it's a phase through life. And in places like Florence... They would do this for a short period of time of their life and then eventually get married. And typically by the age of 35, most men had to get married to a woman. And, you know, this is just some a phase that in your teenage years you, you kind of went through and eventually you would, you know, some of them would outgrow it. Um, but they try to stop it. And for many people, they found that um, it went against their cultural practice. So they actually protested. So a lot of people kind of credit Stonewall, if you know anything about gay history and 1969 in New York as the first kind of gay rights movement. Uh, and this is, you know, challenges that by about 500 years saying no. <laughs> in 1512, in August 31st, 1512, 
um, which just passed, well, passed when I just did this lecture. Um, we find that um, 30, men, uh, 30 young men, particularly people of importance, right, aristocrats, staged the first gay rights movement um, in Florence, Italy. So this is just kind of general to kind of show you how sexuality and the, our understanding of particularly homosexuality um, changes depending on time. <clears throat> If you read the article, you notice that in Mexico, they struggled with this, right? They were like, oh my God, what do we do? What is this? <laughs> we, we, we don't know what homosexuality is. And, you know, they're, they're trying to do everything to kind of pass the buck saying, holy shoot, damn Americans, you know, gave us the gay, <laughs> basically, is, is what the article kind of argues, right? Because Mexico had never encountered something like this. And they're trying to, to make sense of something that they feel is not Mexican. And rather, it's something that's imported into Mexico. So what's happening um, that kind of gave rise to these kind of subcultures in Mexico? Number one, uh, well, the event happens right in 1901, right? Again, as the article, as I mentioned earlier, right? In, prior to the 1900s, there's, there's no concept of homosexual. Um, a lot of people say the Bible, but the Bible is not a reliable source. It's, you know, it's a translation of a translation of another translation of another translation. And, you know, a lot of times as you translate it, you change the meaning. So a lot of people kind of refer to Leviticus as the example. But again, the word homosexual didn't exist, you know, 2,000 years ago or even, you know, three, 4,000 years ago whenever this, this text was created. So they, they would have never used this word. Um, but in Mexico, you know, you have this event that it's called as Cuarenta Uno. And Mexico is struggling with it, right? It's like, what, what do we do with this? Because they didn't have a, at least the, admitted, uh, they, they at least didn't admit that Mexican men had what we would define as gay urges at this time, right? So they're baffled by this event. So hopefully you, you were, um, Kind of caught your attention as to what was happening here right um now there's a few things that are happening that mexico um, along with other european nations are dealing with number one you have the rise of corporate capitalism when we talked about the immigrant generation i talked about how a lot of corporations moved into mexico right they try to uh with the whole porfiriato they try to develop it into a, a modern economic almost Western state. So the idea of work begins to change in not only Mexico, but different parts of, of the Western world. The, for many people, you know, working with your hands, right? Toiling the soil, a concept of manhood, right? Is associated with farming. Um, with this new idea of corporate capitalism, that begins to change. Now, uh, in corporate capitalism, people are sitting behind a, j a desk. So this this notion of being a man, right, being rugged out in the sun, you know, and and, and working with your hands um, begins to disappear. But rather, now you have this notion of sitting behind a desk, and for many people, this is seen as very kind of feminine, right? Secretaries work behind the desk. Men go out and work hard, right? Fish or whatever the heck they do, chop wood, right? Uh, so this 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 idea that masculinity is disappearing, um, thanks to cor uh, corporate capitalism, is seen a bit of a threat to many people. I mean, my dad makes fun of me. My dad, he uh, obviously works with his hands, and he's in a poster, right? He makes something, he builds something. And every so often he mocks me because, you know, I'm, I, I dress well when I go teach and, and um, you know, I say I'm tired. It's like, all you do is sit behind a desk and talk to a few students and grade a few assignments. How, how's that tiring? It is. It's exhausting. But um, in my dad's mind, you know, I'm not really working, right? I'm, I'm having fun, if anything, right? Uh, so these, these kind of jobs are, are kind of tied to this concept of passivity for, for many people. And a lot of it has to do with the world that... It's just changing. Another kind of shift that's taking place is this concept of, of urban growth. Um, in different places in the West, for the first time, you see um, cities really explode in population. 
<clears throat> it's about 50% of people live in rural areas and 50% live in the city. And in Mexico, Mexico, because of corporate capitalism, right, all this foreign investment in Mexico kind of pushes people off their land and forces them to move to the city, bringing um, you know different cultures into the city and, and the city begins to populate and you know you could behave in a particular way where people are not really paying attention to you right if, if you live out in in the rural areas there's all these kind of cheese muscles everybody's looking at your life and you're being critiqued right because everybody knows you but when you live in the city um, uh, you know nobody knows you nobody cares who you are because it's just too many people right so nobody nobody you know you don't really become a target but in doing so you can create a subculture and this is what happens is that there's a growth of a kind of gay subculture along with different cultures at this time and and that's what this event is right you have all these men who like half of them like to dress as women and the other half like the men that they're dancing with and and they're having fun right um and I can almost guarantee you that more events like this happened before and they just never got caught. This is the first one that just happened to kind of stick out and, and Mexico has to deal with it, right? So, so the city allows you the sense of, um, of, of invisibility, uh, being invisible, right? And uh, in doing so, you can do things that you probably couldn't do out in the rural areas or even you know, in the suburbs, right? I mean, think of high school. Jesus Christ, everybody knows your life in high school, right? Then you go to college and nobody cares who you are. So think of it in those terms if that kind of helps you understand how things are changing at this time. Um, and we find that, um, you know, as this behavior um, and, and these actions begin to kind of catch wind in, in, in different societies, uh, Governments begin to say, oh my God, now we got to deal with it. Because again, in this example with Los 41, there's no law against it, right? They couldn't charge these men with anything because there's no laws against homosexuality. They're like, shoot, we got to create something quick. And what we find that in the West, it's the same thing. Um, so you probably have an idea of what homosexual uh, identity looks like based on stereotypes. Well, it's there's a famous event called the Oscar Wilde Affair that helps create that identity in, in the 1890s Oscar Wilde who's a famous writer um, gets called a sodomite and he sues his boyfriend's son because that's who called him a sodomite and basically um, he says how can I be gay or homosexual if I uh, have a wife I have kids right and what happens is that he sues him Oscar Wilde's a famous writer and it captures the attention of England of the of the press and in, in, in making this so public, he puts his life on display where he begins to be questioned. So he ends up losing the case. So therefore, it meant that he was a sodomite, right? He was gay. <clears throat> and he becomes like the poster boy of a homosexual man. I mean, he's a, he's a writer, which means he's not, you know, he's not working with his hands and all that. He's very um, well-dressed, well-groomed, Right. Um, which again are, are things that are associated with homosexuality, He's extravagant. He um, very witty, and and all these kind of character characteristic characteristics that are associated with him become symbolic of a homosexual identity. So Oscar Wilde becomes a poster boy of a gay man, and that stereotype lingers in to our culture today. It's still there. Another important event is for women is called the alice mitchell affair which happens here in the united states in the i think 1880s this woman alice mitchell who's um she's a she's a woman right and um she wants to get married with her girlfriend and for the most part her family kind of let it happen right the relationship take place but then they get concerned with this whole marriage proposal and alice says look i'll dress like a man she's always been very tomboyish but she says, I'll dress like a man, I'll get us a job, I'll, I'll get a good job so I can take care of you. I think her name is Frida. And Frida says yes initially, but then she changes her mind and um, it, it enrages Alice and she kills her. And it becomes a big old trial, she gets put in an insane asylum. But then other cases happen that deal with women and women. And it, 
the 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 press kind of shape it into the Alice Mitchell affair, and and they kind of shape it in a way that says if you enter these type of relationship, you're gonna get murdered. Um, so it's a very kind of negative stereotype, and Alice becomes what's called a butch lesbian, right? That kind of stereotype that we have for lesbian women. And, but this is the American model, all right? Both of these examples are kind of like Western um, models. In Mexico, it's different, and that's part of the reason why I bring these examples up. But again, all these things begin to kind of shape um, how homosexuality, homosexuality becomes much more visible. So those cuarentayunos, I won't... Touch, I won't waste too much time here because you read the article, but you notice how the men got in trouble, basically, right? They didn't know what to do with them. Here are some pictures. This is, again, from my research. <clears throat> Where they're sent to Mexico, uh, sorry, to Veracruz, um, and then to Yucatan to put down revolts because, remember, a lot of people are protesting the Porfiriato, so they put them in the army. And I guess by killing people, you're supposed to regain your manhood, right? <laughs> So, um, and being with other men, that's not going <laughs> to, probably not going to help, but, um, but, uh, you know, they're, they're put in this, in this, um, in, in this military so they can regain their manhood and these people just kind of disappear from history. But what's, what's significant about this event is that the number 41 becomes synonymous with homosexuality to the point where Mexican men today never tend to admit that they're 41 when they turn the age 41 they say i'm 40 or 42 because they feel that when you turn 41 there's a possibility of becoming gay and, and it sounds um funny but it's very much so true in the sense that people believe this not that you're going to turn gay okay um so the, the number 41 becomes uh, symbolic with homosexuality in mexico understand that in your 40s, you go through a midlife crisis and, you know, a lot of things happen in your midlife crisis, get divorced, you know, get yourself a sports car, whatever, right? You go through all these changes, change careers. So that's why 41 kind of is attached to this idea because people are going through midlife crisis. But the event itself really kind of opens up the, this discussion of, of same-sex attraction in Mexico, right? That men like other men in Mexico. Uh, if you can remember, the article talked about how, <clears throat> you know, the Mexicans blame the Americans. You know, pinche gringos brought us <laughs> this idea, right? Or, or the English, because remember, they're coming to invest in Mexico. So they 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 gave us the gay, basically, right? And um, no, you know, Mexico had to address this stuff saying, look, it is part of who we are, even as, as Mexicans. Now, things begin to change. So this idea of, you know, of, of homosexuality um, is in Mexico, right? Because Mexican men do like other Mexican men. But um, what happens is that what we see in the article is that both groups got in trouble, right? And the article highlights this, <clears throat> that both groups were considered gay, right? The, whether you're dressed as a man or whether you're dressed as a woman. However... You know, 40 years, 50 years later, Octavio Paz writes this essay called Hijos de la Chingada. So if you take my Chicano Studies class, we actually read the, the essay. Now, the essay has nothing to do with homosexuality, um, specifically. However, it's a very important essay as to how it defines Mexican manhood, which to some extent shapes the way Mexican men see homosexuality. And Octavio Paz, in this essay, he writes about the history of Mexico saying, look, the Mexican father goes around screwing whatever he wants. He screwed La Malinche, he screwed Mexico, and then just took off, right? And I kind of mentioned this when we talked about the conquest of Mexico. And the Mexican is an orphan, right? He's, um, and, and La Virgen de Guadalupe is our, is our mother, right? She's not a real mother, but... You know, she's a mother of the orphans. And, and the Mexican is just kind of live in isolation and he's a poor lost soul, basically. Uh, and uh, Malinche kind of lost, lost her son, right? Cortez takes Martin to Spain and she loses her son. So we're, we're orphans, right? But really the, the, the major point of this essay is really this notion of the active passive. 
So what Octavio Paz says that the father basically does whatever he wants, the mother gets screwed, right? And in this essay, he says, as long as you're the one screwing, you maintain your masculinity. However, if you're getting screwed, then you lose it, right? And, and this begins to kind of shape homosexuality in Mexican culture. Whereas in America, we don't care if you're the one screwing or getting screwed, right? You're both gay, right? At least this is the way the perception is. In Mexico, it's quite different, right? If you're screwing, you maintain your Mexican male identity, what we call machismo, right? And again, you have to read the essay because he's like, Mexican men go and around doing chingaderas, right? Uh, so the word chingar becomes a very important verb. <clears throat> so he looks at sexuality, even though the intent is not about, the intent of the essay is not about sexuality, but the essay becomes about sexuality because he, he looks at it through this binary system where the chingon is masculine, right? As long as you're screwing, you maintain that identity. But if you're getting screwed, then you become female, right? So women are the chingadas. La Maninche is the chingada, basically, in this essay. And um, if you take the passive role, then you're a chingada too. And when it comes to homosexuality, the dominant one is a chingon. The passive one is a chingada. And there's a sociologist named Tomas, uh, Tomas Almaguer, a Chicano sociologist, that does a study on kind of contemporary Chicano homosexuality, like he wrote this essay in the 90s, but it's still very relevant. He says, well, in Chicano men, it kind of follows the same idea because it's defined based on sexual aim, which again, showcases that we don't follow the American model where both parties are gay. <clears throat> Uh, Tomas Amarguel kind of argues that it's really based on who's the active and who's the passive and you know what, what your role is in all this. So if you're the active, you maintain your masculinity. If you're the passive, then you're considered gay in Chicano culture. And I remember reading about um, the movie American Me and there's a scene where the main kind of drug dealer, when he was a a kid and he's in juvie hall he gets he gets raped in juvie and i heard i read that the mexican mafia had a big problem with that scene because it showed this kind of very important character as very passive so um a lot of problems came out of that particular scene in that in that film like real world problems like people got you know things happen to people in other words because of that scene so um, it's a very um, kind of very much so following this idea of maybe had he been the one that that was active, the scene wouldn't have been that controversial to the Mexican mafia. Who knows? So that's the way we see kind of Mexican homosexuality under this particular lens. When it comes to women, so this kind of reiterates the article um, that you read, <clears throat> and and the article notes that's very kind of problematic with you know, looking at a history of lesbian women in Mexican culture. Because, you know, particularly historically speaking, Mexican women did not have that kind of butch, um, uh, butch identity like the American model, right? So the author says, you know, when we look at lesbianism in Chicano culture in history, it's very problematic. Number one, we don't have that many sources. Right? We don't have like these very famous cases like Oscar Wilde or Alice Mitchell where it helps create these identities. What we have rather is that we have to kind of read between the lines and do oral histories and things like that to try to understand what these people felt. And she says most of it's based on these friendships because as a society we do allow women to have certain intimate relationships with other women. They don't have to be sexual, but there is a sense of it's intimacy. I'll give you an example. I mean, if you ever gone out on a double date and, um, you know, you never see the two guys saying, you know, they, you know, 
it's a heterosexual double date. You never see the two guys saying, oh, me and John are going to go to the bathrooms. We'll be right back, ladies. <laughs> That's just, that, that never happens, right? However, if the two women that you're dating kind of go, we're going to the bathroom together, nobody thinks much of it, right? If the two men were to go, I was like, well, what's going on there, right? Why are two guys going to the bathroom together, right? To freshen up their makeup? What's what's happening there, <laughs> right? So this, this idea of passion and friendships, sometimes it's allowed in women relationships that allow them to engage in certain um, you know, in, in these very kind of um, passionate relationships. And, and again, it doesn't need to be sexual. Um, <clears throat> a lot of times it's, you know, it's these people really have deep feelings for each other. And the article talks about this, right, with some examples where she says, you know, she quotes a lady saying, I would go dancing with my husband's sister. Every afternoon we go to the Tardiada, and we dance. I fell in love with her. I was really in love with her, not my husband. Right? And again, she didn't have this kind of butch lesbian outfit, right, that we typically associate with homosexuality. Um, but rather, it was just these two women, at least one woman, who really fell in love with her husband's sister. And a lot of it has to do because, as the article notes, right, we allow women that space to come together. Right? And, and, um, in doing so, they develop these strong bonds with each other. <clears throat> and she talks about it in this way that, uh, unlike the American model and, and the Mexican model, is that um, you know you kind of you you, you kind of have to repress these feelings. So sometimes, and there are examples of women being with other women pre nineteen eighty, right? where they would engage in these type of relationships, but they couldn't talk about it. Oh, they're just friends, right? They're really good friends, we would say. And a lot of it has to do with this idea of that the author calls silence, right? She, she describes silence as a, almost like a ideological tool. And she says, you know, the, this concept of silence, it's, it's a paradox because number one, it protects them by not talking about it, by not being open about it, you know, they don't feel the repercussions from the community. And some of you might be able to relate to this experience, whether maybe you came out as gay or or family members have. And, you know, everybody always kind of knew, but nobody ever said anything. But the moment that they do, you know, they, they, they get bashed on either by the community, by parents, you know, you're no longer my son, you're no longer my daughter, whatever it meant, right? Whatever happened. And silence, by not talking about it, at the very least, it protects them from this, from this experience, right? From this, you know, be, you know, being excommunicated by the, by, by loved ones, by, by the community. Um, so it's a way to kind of protect themselves. But at the same time, it, as the author kind of notes, right? It's very problematic because it doesn't allow them to express who they are under their own terms. Rather, they have to stay hidden, right? In the shadows um, and not express who they really are. So it, it you know, things have changed since the 1950s and 60s. But um, again, we see how how this idea can, uh, again, help them and hurt them at the same time. All right. So what do we learn? Well, I, I hope you found this kind of uh, interesting. I, I want you to understand that when it comes to sexual identity, it's very fluid. You know, again, in the, in the Middle Ages, everything was considered sodomy, right? And all of a sudden, by the 1900s, the word sodomy is really kind of defined only for gay people, particularly men. Um, so I want you to walk out understanding that the concept of homosexuality uh, and even sexual identities are very much so socially constructed. We create them, right? These identities. And also kind of show you that um, maybe you already knew about the number 41. A lot of times we don't know about it because... Uh, particularly your generation, we're, we're beginning to follow more the American model now. Um, <clears throat> so the number 41 is kind of forgotten. So a lot of times you might have to ask your grandparents, particularly they're from Mexico, or maybe your parents might know, because your parents might be about my age, and even people my age don't know. I mean, I found out by doing research. Um, but a lot of times our parents um, might know this number being tied to... Um, to homosexuality. They don't they don't have a clue about the event, but they just know that number 41 is associated with homosexuality. 
<clears throat> and then lastly, we find how Chicano homosexuality is constantly shifting depending on historical circumstances, right? At one time, both people were gay, right? After the, that event of Los 41, both groups were considered gay. And then Octavio Paz writes this essay, and then all of a sudden, only the one that's passive is gay, right? Same thing with women. You know, for the most part, you know, nobody really knew about it. And then uh, since like the 1990s, it's becoming much more open. Um, and I have family who's, who's gay, such as uh, particularly my, my wife's side. And, you know, they, they got a earful to, to say nicely from, from their family. So, um, you know, again, this is what we see um, kind of shaping uh, these events begin to shape homosexual identity. Uh, things are probably improving, I would say. I would like to argue. I, I would like to think. But definitely there's still a lot of people in Chicano culture that just don't accept it because we still think in those terms of active, passive, and so forth. All right, so we stop there. And um, hope you feel like you, you learned something new.